there's something inherently riskier about actively announcing our presence in the universe, like sending out a beacon and saying, hey, here we are. There was a lot of really philosophically interesting stuff that didn't seem to be part of the debate. And there are actually so, so many unsettled questions in the world. And what's needed is not more dogmatism, right? Not more people certain that their answer is the correct answer when it's actually, there's room for debate. And what we need is more open-mindedness and consistency in our thinking. It's November. 2020, and this is episode 48 of The Wow Signal. This is your host, Paul Carr. Joining us soon will be my co-host, Daniela DePaulis, whose idea it was to have on our special guest, Chelsea Hiramia. Now, the topic will be primarily the ethics and meta-ethics of messaging extraterrestrial intelligence, or METI. Dr. Hiramia's interest in SETI and METI was largely sparked by her interaction with Julia De Marinas, who you may recall was on the show on episode 42. And we'll, of course, have links to that in the show notes. Now, this is what I regard as round one of a discussion of the ethics of METI. We've already had quite a lot of discussion with Douglas Vakoch, who's the head of Medi.org, and he has actually done some messaging projects. Danielle herself has been involved in not in messaging, but so much, but in transmissions into space of of human brain waves and also images that are bounced off the moon, as you may recall from a recent Wow Signal Live. I would love to get Chelsea Hiramia along with Julia De Marinas and some other people, like possibly David Grinspoon, is the author of Earth and Human Hands, or Douglas Vakoch himself, around a table and have a discussion about the ethics of Medi. Uh, that may happen, or something like it may happen in the not-too-distant future on this podcast. Stay tuned. And now a little bit about our guest. Chelsea Haramia received her Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Colorado at Boulder, where she specialized in ethics. She's now an assistant professor in the philosophy department at Spring Hill College. She is also co-editor of the online journal 1000 Word Philosophy, which houses a growing set of original 1000 word essays on philosophical questions, figures, and arguments aimed at an audience of philosophers and non-philosophers alike. She is published in the area of normative ethics, bioethics, animal ethics, aesthetics, feminist philosophy, and astrobiology ethics. Her current work involves ethical and meta-ethical analyses of space exploration and of the search for intelligent life in particular. I am here with my co-host, Daniela DePaulis. Hi, everyone. And our special guest, Chelsea Haramia. Hello, Chelsea. Hi, Paul. Hi, Daniela. Thanks so much for having me. Now, Daniela uh, wanted to invite Chelsea because of a talk she gave on the ethics of Medi. Where was that, Daniela? That was in our monthly meetings with the SETI community. Every month, uh, there is a scholar presenting a topic about SETI. And uh, not very often we have uh, people from the humanities. So I was immediately drawn to uh, Chelsea's topic, the ethics of METI. 
uh, which uh, we often discuss within the SETI committee. Uh, but uh, the ethics of MEDI was really something we never really addressed before. So I was very curious to, uh, to hear about it. I'm going to give you my dumbed down idea of what it is, and then you can sort of steer me in a better direction, Elsie. Um, sure. Most of the discussion I've heard about the about Medi, whether it's a good idea or not, is about how much additional risk does it represent to humans? Is that the whole story, or is there more to it? Uh, well, there the focus of my my talk and some of this research that I'm doing is on the risk analysis component of of Medi, and so it is a major part of the story for sure. So. What's your top level analysis of what those risks are? Um, so I, I argue in, in this paper, in this talk, um, that, that there's kind of asymmetry of, of risk and that we need to kind of make our risk analysis a little more fine grained. And when we discover what's at work in the risks involved in each of these practices, um, the two practices being active searches or METI, um, kind of intentionally sending directed messages uh, or signals into space um, versus passive messaging or SETI, kind of scanning the cosmos for evidence of techno signatures in a, in a more passive way. Um, so that, that these two projects are not ethically identical. And then that, and that where they diverge is in their um, risk component. So uh, to, to expand on that, um, both active and passive searches for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, c carry with them risks, right? None is risk-free. However, there is something about METI or active searches that make them inherently riskier. And that inherent risk does not apply to the more passive searches. Um, this does not, of course, mean that passive searches are risk-free, um, but that's the highlight of, of this uh, argument, is this distinction. And so to talk about the difference in risk, I want to emphasize this idea that um, there's something inherently riskier about actively announcing our presence in the universe, like sending out a beacon and saying, hey, here we are, okay? So I, in my talk, I referenced a quote by Adam Corbett, um, and he mentions that it is not inherently riskier to actively message uh, extraterrestrial intelligence because there's not a clear and present risk of danger, okay? And he makes this really important point about there being not only just not a clear and present risk of danger, but there's actually like potential really significant benefit of this practice of, of active SETI or of METI. And so what I want to take issue with is this idea that something is not inherently risky if it is not kind of manifesting a clear and present danger. And uh, that I believe is not, is not correct. So something can be inherently risky without at the same time manifesting a clear and present danger. And so this is the very kind of uh, everyday example I gave is something like driving. Um, we know how risky driving can be. It's one of the leading causes of death in many places, but not every act of driving involves something like clear and present danger even if driving itself is an inherently risky activity. So if something is inherently risky, that means that the risk is sort of part and parcel with the activity itself. And that's true of driving. You're getting behind a very powerful machine that's capable of accelerating to uh, a high rate of speed. And um, if you are, for example, driving in a thunderstorm or driving on a uh, highway with a speed limit that's extreme, you know, the U.S. with a stream, speed limit that's extremely high compared to maybe city travel, the, the, the danger um, can arise given the circumstances of the driving activity, right? So if you're driving in torrential rain, pour, rain downpour, or if you're driving at high rates of speed, you've got a clear and present danger there to your, to your physical safety and well-being. 
But that doesn't mean that every single time you're driving, there's a clear and present danger. Um, if you're kind of like putzing down a couple blocks to go to the grocery store, then that's not really a clear and present danger, even though the driving itself is still an inherently risky activity insofar as we're talking about the activity itself. So when we're thinking about something like Medi or active SETI, actively messaging, there's not a clear and present danger. Absolutely, right? There's at least as far as we know, right? We have no evidence of a clear and present danger right now. But that does not mean that the activity itself couldn't be inherently risky. So why might active messaging be inherently risky? One of the reasons that I appeal to is the fact that active messaging it removes this opportunity for evaluating the target um, of your communication before sending your communication. And this ability to evaluate your target before you send uh, a communication is what creates the uh, kind of inherently riskier component of the active messaging, okay? So what I, what I then draw out after making this distinction between the fact that active messaging is all by itself as an activity inherently riskier, um, whereas passive searches, they at least allow for, they certainly don't guarantee, but they at least allow for the possibility of evaluating the target of communication before engaging in communication, is that there's a difference in what we're thinking about when we're thinking about um, when we start engaging in this risk analysis, right? So passive searches, less risky, not risk-free, but not nearly as inherently risky as the active searches because of this allowance for um, the possibility of evaluation of the target. When people talk about, at least in my research and what I've uh, looked at when um, astronomers and all sorts of other folks are kind of weighing in on this question of should we be messaging isn't this risky? Aren't we worried about alien invasions? Aren't we worried about what uh, could happen to planet Earth or our resources or our people or our future generations? There's lots of people focused on what I call outcome-based risk assessment, right? And so they're worried about potential outcomes. And a lot of people who are hesitant about or positively opposed to active messaging, they like to highlight the potential risks of harm. And the potential risks of harm are potentially very serious, even catastrophic in a global sense. And that's something to care about ethically, of course, right? And so far as harm matters morally. On the other side of it though, and Corbett himself mentions this, and I think this is really useful, active messaging could bring with it potential benefits and potentially very, very significant benefits. And so active messaging could be the thing that potentially prevents humanity from killing itself off, right? Maybe um, messaging with extraterrestrial intelligence allows us to figure out how to fight climate change if we reach a point where it's too drastic and humanity's kind of, as a species is, is threatened, um, humanity is, then it's possible at least, it's a possible outcome, right, that this activity, active messaging, is the thing that allows us to save ourselves or that gives us help in preventing some global catastrophe. You know, I mentioned climate change, but it could be, you know, fill in the blanks. We could speculate all day long about potential ways that it could go really great for us to make contact and to initiate contact. And so the idea here is that so much of what we talk about when we talk about outcome-based risk assessment is potential benefit versus kind of potential harm. And both of these outcome, and of course, you know, the allowance of a mixed outcome, right? Uh, beneficial, harmful, and neutral outcome. So all of these outcome-based risk assessments rely on our, what I would like to call pure speculation. We simply have no evidence of what it is we would be communicating with. And so all we can do is, it is 100% speculation at this point. We have no um, kind of demonstrable evidence of any details about extraterrestrial intelligence. And so what we're doing is what uh, a couple of philosophers who write about synthetic biology, Mark Bodeau and Mark Triant, they call deciding in the dark. And so when we're deciding in the dark, 
we're deciding about whether we should engage in an activity, the outcome of which we are completely unsure of is entirely opaque to us. And so because of the fact that this is different from our kind of normal everyday outcome-based risk assessment. If we're engaged in some risk assessment, we're thinking about whether or not to do something, we can often at least come up with a way of saying, well, there's some probability of this, there's some probability of that, and we can assign higher or lower probabilities to different outcomes and make an informed decision at least, even if, even if it turns out to be mistaken because we can't actually predict the future. But when we're doing this deciding in the dark, we are unjustified in assigning any probabilities to any outcome except for the claim that there's a non-zero probability to all outcomes we can think of and allow for the possibility that there's plenty of outcomes we can't even think of that also have a non-zero probability. And so they're all sort of equally up for grabs in terms of our assessment of risk. And they end up like canceling each other out, right? There's just, none gives us reason to proceed because we can't say, well, there's this risk, but there's more probability of this benefit, so let's go this direction versus that because we don't get to say there's more probability of any particular outcome. And so if we're thinking about what we're risking in terms of outcome, and if we're deciding in the dark, which we are when it comes to searching and messaging, then outcome-based risk assessment, I think it's a useful practice. I think it's got its place and I'll, I can talk about that, but it doesn't give us any kind of valuable information if we're thinking about whether it's ethically acceptable to take on the risk um, because because we just don't get to assign any legitimate probabilities uh, other than non-zero to any of the available outcomes. However, outcome-based risk assessment is different from inherent risk. And so an activity can be inherently ris risky even if we don't appeal to any of the potential outcomes um, of which we are uh, unaware. And so what makes active messaging inherently riskier is that we know already about the activity itself that it removes the opportunity for evaluation of the target that we're communicating with. We're not evaluating any extraterrestrial intelligence before sending out these meta signals, right? And so removing that possibility is something that comes with METI, whereas with SETI or more passive searches, if we detect a techno signature or evidence of an extraterrestrial intelligence, that detection by itself doesn't guarantee that we are ourselves being detected. Although, of course, it's possible that we are being detected or have already been, but it doesn't guarantee our detection in the way that the active searches do. And so that search at least allows for the possibility of evaluating something that we passively detect in the cosmos before deciding whether to communicate, whether to send a message. And then of course it allows us to have some more information to, to add to the deliberation about what to include in a message, right? And so if we're engaging in METI, we're sending out messages with no information about um, the subject to whom, with whom we're trying to communicate. If we waited and had um, the opportunity to detect extraterrestrial intelligence and have at least some information, like we'd have so, we'd know, have some knowledge about the techno signature, about some details, that could be useful in informing the decision about whether to respond, whether to reply, and also the decision about what to include in the message and, and what would be justified, or at least what would be worth kind of thinking about, if we're thinking about what to include. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that this means that all things considered, um, passive searches and active searches. Passive searches are gonna be guaranteed to be more ethically appropriate than active searches, but it does mean that there is this ethical uh, disanalogy or asymmetry between the two. And METI is inherently riskier. And so we should care about that. And all this discussion about what the outcomes might be of messaging actively versus passively waiting and, right? Because passively waiting could, could mean that we don't get the information we need to help ourselves um, if there's some sort of global threat or something. And that could be catastrophic. And if that's the thing we're trying to avoid, it's a possibility no matter which way we go. So there's this, there's this kind of asymmetry, but also that's just what I think an important ethical consideration. It's something we should be injecting into the dialogue about whether and when to actively uh, message, to actively reach out and say, um, here we are and here's our message. 
I'm thinking about um, the fact that we keep transmitting uh, very regularly. Um, so um, it's not uh, perhaps made, so we're not uh, targeting extraterrestrial intelligence, but for example, uh, transmissions with um, uh, probes and uh, deep space network, uh, that is already um, a form of transmission into mm -hmm. space that is extremely powerful, even more perhaps than uh, most uh, matey messages. So uh, do you think that this reasoning can be applied to that as well? Or um, how, how, for example, uh, can we consider the ethics of this uh, transmission in relation to, um, to this risk that you are mentioning? Yeah, so I think that is an important response to consider because it is it is kind of a response or a, a kind of a challenge. Or you could formulate it into a kind of a challenge where you could say, hey, there's this project, METI, and it's intentionally sending directed signals and attempting to notify others of our presence. And there's other projects that aren't intending to do that thing in particular, but they're still kind of incidentally doing this notification or at least like sending out a beacon that could be could be see uh, you know recognized could be noticed could be detected and so that kind of raises the challenge of well if we're already doing the kind of thing that's very detectable are we just not doing anything new <laughs> right with with messaging with with medi and so um i mean so thomas cordalesi has a, a really interesting paper where he talks about just this continuum of astrobiological signaling. And he doesn't just talk about our own techno signatures of, of these signals that you were mentioning, Daniela, or of just you know our unintentional radio leakage for, for decades now, um, but going back billions of years, right? Going back to when we, when our planet started, you know, showing evidence of life, right? Um, and so, We've been signaling, uh, planet Earth at least, has been signaling evidence of life for an extremely long period of time, um, comparatively. And then we humans have been providing evidence of uh, kind of te our techno signatures or our, our um, existence as an intelligent species in the cosmos for you know a much shorter period of time, but in a much louder sort of way, I would imagine, um, given what I know about astrobiological searches. And so what's new, you know, what's so bad about Medi? It's just kind of one point on this continuum of us being here in the cosmos, um, showing that showing that we're here in various ways. And so one thing to consider, at least ethically, about this potential difference is our role as moral agents and taking on responsibility for what it is we're deciding to do. So of course the astro, um, the kind of bio signatures that planet earth has been uh, emitting as it were for billions and billions of years, that's not an intentional activity. There was no moral agent you know, that we know of um, doing that sort of, uh, ev providing that sort of evidence. Even when we are sending out kind of high powered or targeted signals that aren't Medi related that aren't about extraterrestrial intelligence detection or notification. Um, those those have a, a different component to them that at least makes a moral difference, even if it might not make a difference in outcome. And so the moral difference there is intentions, I guess. And so what philosophers sometimes talk about is the doctrine of double effect. Um, and so there can be multiple effects for a given action and only some of the effects are what was intended and other effects might be merely foreseen as possibilities um, or realities but not what was what the aim or the goal of the activity is and so that can make a moral difference um, if we're thinking at least about responsibility for our actions so if we're sending out signals and so one of the things i mentioned in the talk is uh, the practice of like pinging asteroids and trying to detect the threat, um, uh, like a, cat a global catastrophic threat to Earth from an asteroid impact, that's going to involve sending some pretty high powered signals out into space that could be detected. But the goal of that is to 
to target and mitigate uh, a very specific and, and very real potential threat uh, of asteroid impact. And then there's this foreseen side effect of, you know, potentially also announcing our, our place in the universe. And, and that's different from an activity that isn't trying to mitigate any other particular threat and isn't just instead just saying, here we are. That's the goal. The goal is saying, here we are. Um, and that means you're taking responsibility for that sort of decision. And, and we can ask what we are willing to kind of take on in terms of, of this kind of risk. And so maybe we're willing to take on the inherent risk of announcing our presence in the universe if it means mitigating a very important risk of asteroid impact. But maybe it seems like the risk is a bit superfluous um, or a bit um, just unnecessary if we're not mitigating any other threat and we're just saying, hey, here we are, come talk to us. Um, again, because that removes the opportunity for evaluation, or at least um, it, pre it prevents that potential. Um, and so, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that because I've been, I've been waxing on and on, um, but, but go ahead and ask any follow-up questions you have. I have another burning question about yes. um, why do you think uh, this point of view about METI uh, has perhaps changed since the Arecibo message. So um, I never had the opportunity to speak with Frank Drake about uh, his decision to send this message in, uh, I believe, 1974. Mm -hmm. um, do you think back then uh, this question of possible danger was uh, not considered or is it something that emerged later on? more recently perhaps, or um, as it simply, uh, we have become more uh, um, cautious about uh, certain um, uh, threats that maybe we were not aware about uh, mm -hmm. a few decades ago. Yeah, well, I, so I'm not sure if it was unconsidered. I wasn't, I wasn't around, but it's possible that it was, and maybe there was even some reason to dismiss it. So um, I don't pretend that this is like, the only consideration or a decisive consideration, but I do believe it is an important consideration that we should be uh, actively evaluating. Now, it's possible that there may be, it may be defeated, right? Um, there may be overall reason to ignore this consideration or it gets outweighed by something more important. Um, and so that's totally on the table when it comes to thinking about kind of the ethical ramifications of this. Um, but when we're thinking about the past messages, from what I understand of those very, very early kinds of messaging attempts, they were largely symbolic or ceremonial in nature. And they, they at least according to some astrobiologists I've talked to, they just seem much less likely to be effective <laughs> um, than something that's very targeted and high powered. And like, you know, it sounds from what I gather that there are individuals and, and um, parties out there who are, who are really trying to find places that are habitable um, and, and to, to send messages directly to these and to really, really increase as much as possible the chances of communication. And that seems um, to be different in terms of, of risk from saying just like here's you know here's a here's a message about ourselves that we're just sending out just generally into the cosmos or here's you know a golden record that somebody may or may not ever come across um, so when we build in these intentions and that seems to be a new component recently is the ability to detect like Goldilocks planets and habitable areas of our galaxy and to say um, we are, we're really trying to maximize the chances of, of contact instead of, um, we're just allowing for it. And so both, both of them bring with it the inherent riskiness that I worry about. Um, but one is sort of maximizing that risk in a way that something like the Arecibo message or the Voyager spacecraft are not maximizing in that way. Um, and so that's at least something to, to keep in mind ethically. Um, do we have a responsibility to be careful about where we're positioning, where we're targeting and what we're targeting? And, and if, we, if we find some area of the cosmos, area of our galaxy that we think is habitable and has a good chance of, of harboring life, 
it seems to matter morally at least and probably prudentially or practically as well um if we can assess what's there before sending something that might be better than um than just sending something without taking the time to do some sort of assessment or evaluation now i don't want to suggest that uh, i at least i personally or as a philosopher am opposed to messaging or opposed to in sending directed intentional messages at, at potentially habitable parts of our galaxy but i do kind of wonder what the rush might be right um and the more we grow technologically and the more we have a chance to sit down and debate this practically, scientifically, and ethically, um, the more kind of useful information and conclusions we might arrive at. And, and I think that's going to be really helpful in, in, you know, so, if, you know, if the outcome is that we are, you know, we, we as humanity end up messaging no matter what, it still matters how we arrive at the decision to message and then when we arrive, um, you know, and under what information, under what um, agreements, under what consent and things like that. And so, so I think that there is some, some kind of interesting differences between those very, very early messages and current messages. Um, there's still an inherent risk to both of those, but there's definitely kind of moral considerations or ethical considerations that crop up in kind of present day medi activities that we weren't seeing with those, with those much earlier ones. I'd like to circle back. Go ahead. You said earlier that, um, there are inherent risks to passive study. To give us a sort of a summary of what what you think those risks are. Oh sure. So um, good. Yeah. The uh, inherent risks with passive study are the possibility that we are not just already detectable, but already being detected, right, or potentially observed, and so. If the thing that's inherently risky is not having the ability to evaluate the target of communication before attempting communication, or before um, notifying others that we're here, then if we're already, you know, if we're just passively sitting here, but we are loud enough or present enough that we're being detected, then that risk is realized. Right. And so if we're being observed right now or if we are have been detected and there's, um, you know, plans to to check back in or something like that, then then we're already risking that that kind of issue of not being in a position to evaluate anything about extraterrestrial intelligence before there's some sort of contact. And so that's totally a possibility. I acknowledge that, as we mentioned, like we know, Earth has been emitting biosignatures for billions of years, techno signatures for decades, and um, that's does that means that you know, passive study is not risk free. But the, the 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 activity of active messaging, it is still inherently riskier because it is still possible that we have not been detected. It's still possible that. Um, we are not going to be detected unless um, we put something out there. And so this still allows for the possibility that um, METI means we are, we are attempting to engage in a practice that the success of which will remove the possibility for evaluation of whatever it is we contact. Whereas passive SETI, not risk-free, not even inherently risk-free, still allows for that possibility. And so there's maybe a scenario, right, where um, we are passively searching, we're scanning skies for a techno signature, we detect a techno signature or something that's evidence of not just life, but intelligent life. And then we take all that information and use it to come up with the kind of the best possible message or the best possible course of future action. And that's a different scenario from a scenario where we are sending out messages, we're sending out signals, and um, we're, we're putting something out there and we don't know anything about the recipient at all. Um, and if they're out there, then that kind of situation could allow for. And so we don't even have to assume, right, that an ETI or extraterrestrial intelligence might be hostile or um, might think too little of us in terms of our, our kind of worth or value, but they might just not understand our message, right? Misinterpret. And so 
uh, having as much information as possible before communicating is not just a way of preventing like harmful outcomes from a hostile civilization, but also from preventing harmful outcomes that are potentially avoidable due to miscommunication, right? Because that's a significant worry with the possibility of communicating with uh, life that evolved in a completely different corner of the universe, uh, not completely different, but in somewhere else um, that could have evolved in much different ways, such that communication is, is something to be handled very carefully. And there's more opportunity for careful communication if we get that opportunity for evaluation. Again, not a guarantee, but allowing for that possibility seems ethically important in terms of the risk. Whereas we're just removing that possibility altogether and engaging in less careful communication, less careful messaging by sending a message to whomever might receive it without having any information about the recipient. Okay. So I, now there's something called the SETI paradox. I'm sure you've probably heard about mm -hmm. where if nobody transmits, then nobody receives. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, right now, given the current technology, we really can't eavesdrop very right. with any any kind of probability at all uh, mm -hmm. on another civilization's radio signals. They would have to be sending them intentionally, mm -hmm. and yeah, maybe someday that will will get that point. But we're not there now, certainly. How does that play into this whole ethical question of nobody's got to transmit or nobody will receive? Yeah, good. So I mean, the paradox itself is based on a couple of assumptions that, of course. Um, not yet founded, um, even though there, it's possible that that is the kind of techno signature that we would receive, um, assuming that uh, ETI is kind of sensor, like equipped with the sensory capabilities that we have, right, and and has evolved to have the same similar kinds of technology at least. Um, and you know that's not that's not guaranteed. Again, we're we're totally ignorant of of what's going on um, with other civilizations if if they exist, and so. Setting aside kind of the assumptions that are built into that, which I might return to um, if we have time, there is still this, this worry that if we're talking about messaging so that we try to jumpstart communication, so that we, if nobody, you know, so that we remove this possibility that um, just no one gets, no one gets to kind of hear anybody else. What we're what we're thinking about in terms of our motivation, I imagine, is the benefits of communicating, right? Um, we're jumpstarting communication because we want the benefits, even if it's just knowledge, scientific progress, um, or just really useful um, information, or just kind of a, a greater understanding of the of the world, the universe, and our place in it. Um, these are these are benefits that we should not um, ignore, I think. But there's still outcome-based assessments of why we should be doing what we're doing. And so anybody who comes in and says, hey, we should be messaging because it's possible that if we don't, we never get in contact with anyone because they're waiting for us, we're waiting for them, we've got this paradox, somebody's got to message first, somebody's got to communicate first, somebody's got to put it out there, or at least that's our understanding now and that's a possibility. All of that is based on this idea that the outcome could be really good, right? And so anybody claiming that could get met with a challenge of somebody coming in on the other side and saying, well, what if that's the very thing that causes somebody to say, oh, here they are, let's let's go um, you know, mine this planet for resources or send, <laughs> send a little virus that unfolds and prevents us from advancing scientifically if you've read the three body problem or something like that, right? And so anytime anybody says, here's what we should do because of the potential benefit, somebody else would come in on the other side and say, well, here's what we shouldn't do because it, it brings up this potential risk. And it's all merely potential at this point. And all of that reasoning is, is the kind of stuff that really just isn't informative. It isn't helpful in our deliberations because we can't assign any probabilities other than non-zero to any of these potential outcomes. And so all of this discussion, I think it's really interesting because it's going to prepare us for what, you know, if we ever do make contact in whatever form. Um, if we've already started thinking about these possibilities, I think that's great. I think that's really going to use, usefully inform our deliberations. But if we're using it to think about the question of whether or not to message, I think it's just really unhelpful because, again, we're deciding in the dark. And so if we're saying we need to initiate contact because otherwise we never will make contact with anybody and we'll miss out on these potential benefits, 
then we also say, well, what if we miss out on all these potential risks of like global catastrophe? And and you end up with an impasse, right? You, you just end up, if you start focusing on what the potential outcomes of messaging versus not messaging are, you, you're guaranteed to reach this impasse given the utter opacity of, of the outcomes because we just don't know anything about the recipients um, that uh, any extraterrestrial intelligence we might we might detect or come into contact with. So I think that's I think that's something to really keep in mind when because so often the debate ends up getting lost in these weeds of of potential outcomes, good ones, bad ones, neutral ones, mixed ones. And until we have some evidence, some information, some details that can allow us to assign justifiably some probability um, calculations were really, it's really just not giving us any useful information for, for what we should be concluding about whether or not to message. Okay. Uh, yeah. You want another question, Danielle? Well, uh, more than a question, just a, a thought about the fact that uh, connecting a bit um, with your question, actually, Paul, um, I'm thinking that um, indeed, uh, even if we don't transmit any message into space, it it is still, a, a, in my opinion, a worthwhile to think about messaging and uh, uh, even uh, composing messages that uh, might never be transmitted. Simply mm -hmm. because by um, engaging in the practice of composing messages and also exploring the uh, possible technologies to transmit these messages, which could be, for example, optical as well as radio, um, we might be able to better understand how another civilization could be attempting to communicate with us. So it is indeed at least a two-way uh, process. So it it's kind of uh, follows up on how uh, humankind evolved into um, a species that can can talk. Uh, it didn't just start uh, all at once. It was a very long process that started with maybe a few stuttering words or sound at the beginning and evolved thanks to the two-way communication. And um, so to understand how another civilization um, might be communicating, uh, it is uh, important, in my opinion, that we also try to understand how we might be communicating as a spacefaring civilization. So this is just a, a thought I would like to include. Well, I agree. And I think that it also is really important because if we do ultimately make contact, whether it's because somebody else uh, initiates contact with us or vice versa, the amount of time like it's going to be a pretty compressed time frame for thinking about what we want in our message, right? But that's going to be, I think, probably one of the most important things to think about, right? Um, if it comes to communicating. And so if we've already done like what you suggest, like thinking about messaging, thinking about what to have in a message, thinking about what to communicate, thinking about the possible ways um, communication could work um, and can function and could be successful, all of that, if we get all of that work done beforehand, or not all of it, but like a lot, like a chunk of it, such that we have all this sort of deliberation that that work, the deliberative work has been done. And then if and when there is contact, then we're just we've just had that much more progress that we've already made because because it's gonna be, I imagine, a pretty compressed time frame. People are gonna wanna respond, we're gonna wanna find out, we're gonna want and the more we've thought about this and now is the time to think right because now is the time to speculate and now we can consider all sorts of things and not be pressured to respond to anything in particular because there's nothing to respond to and then that just gets us that much further along toward our goal of successful communication if that is ultimately um the the appropriate path forward and it we have then content to potentially consider and weigh and we can take whatever details, whatever information we have from whatever we're detecting or whatever we're receiving and and then throw that into our deliberation. And then we've already got all this other useful stuff. And then we're that much further along in making a, a really well-reasoned choice about what to do and what to communicate. And I think that is actually really important. It's kind of a, this useful fiction of we, the human race, right? Uh, but of course, 
we we never agree on anything, right? And there's there's already, as we've already pointed out, there's already there have been numerous messaging exercises in the past. Some out of Russia, some out of the Arecibo uh, message. There have been others. It's entirely possible that the the care and the and the careful thought that we'd like to see put into the messaging would be not there, right? It's it's unlikely to be that consistent or uniform. Oh, sure. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. And, and there's, of course, there's all the well, whole, there's nationalism rearing its ugly head, right? You well, know, so our message is better than your message sort of thing. Yeah. To respond to that. Yeah. So there's, I mean, so that's another kind of worry about just, you know, the nature of humanity and, and what we're likely to do. Bay coach, of course, um, points out in, in something, I forget where, um, we should be, you know, we're, we're not kind of cohesive as a species where there's a lot of kind of cultural disagreement and our personal disagreement. There's all sorts of disagreement and, and maybe it's important to actually accurately portray ourselves as um, creatures who, um, who debate, who engage, who argue, um, who disagree at times. And I think, you know, there's, there's something to be said for that. And that by itself doesn't, isn't obviously a bad thing. Um, however, it's also, I think, um, a convenient fiction to claim that uh, humans never agree on anything. That's a pretty strong claim. And so that's something that people appeal to when um, arguing for, and this is where we can talk about metaethics, when arguing for what we call like ethical relativism, right? Um, so maybe morality is just human construct. It's just relative to human beliefs. Um, it's just something that you know, um, evolved out of um, humans need to, to cooperate to survive as a species or something like that. Um, and the fact that there's so much, there seems to be at least so much disagreement about morality, about ethics across humans, across cultures. Um, maybe that's evidence that there's nothing real that we're tracking when we're making moral judgments, right? Um, and therefore, it's not a real thing. It's just kind of a, a purely subjective sort of um, sort of endeavor, uh, morality or ethical reasoning, that is. So one of the really interesting responses to that is to point out a couple of things. Number one, there are uh, activities, disciplines, et cetera, that there's also plenty of disagreement about, and yet we still think are pursuing um, objective truths about the world. So science is a great example, right? Science itself, um, it's full of disagreement, right? Um, scientists are reliably disagreeing with one another. Um, we disagree across um, kind of debates and questions. And people often focus on a lot of the, the kind of easy cases, right? Science can um, correctly tell you the dimensions of a room or something, and that can be an objective fact, whereas whether line is wrong might, might be, so seem to be more subjective or something like that. And so pointing out the cases where there's a lot of clear-cut agreement um, with something like science that we all trust to be like at least pursuing the truth, even if it doesn't always get there, um, and then using that to say, well, look, people disagree about abortion or um, whether to wear a mask or whatever, right? There's all this disagreement. Therefore, um, this other project, ethics or ethical reasoning, it's not tracking anything or it's not pursuing real truth, just pursuing kind of an investigation of what individual or, or cultural humans believe. So one thing we can do is say, well, let's flip the tables there, right? So let's think about there's, you know, what's the fundamental nature of reality? Physicists disagree about this, right? Is it quarks? Is it strings? Is it, you know, like there's not, um, there's a lot of disagreement among experts uh, about a lot of scientific questions and it doesn't just have to be physics. It can be um, like nutritional science. There's just so much disagreement. There's just kind of, um, it's a process, right? And so there's, it's maybe disingenuous to highlight the really contentious cases in one area, like like morality or ethics, and then kind of fail to highlight all the disagreement in this in this other project, maybe like science. And if we flip the tables, we can say, well, let's think about something like you know whether string theory or quarks is is the um, correct account of the fundamental nature of reality. Um, let's look at all the disagreement about that, and then on the flip side, think about how much agreement there is across humans across time across cultures that with the claim that gratuitous suffering is bad right unnecessary suffering is a bad thing right that's a moral claim that's a value claim 
And there is actually widespread agreement about that across humans, across cultures, across history. And what we end up disagreeing about is maybe some of like the details of gratuitous suffering, right? Whether something qualifies as gratuitous suffering. And so if you, um, if you talk to a vegan, they're going to say, if they're, especially if they're an ethical vegan, they're going to say, we don't need to eat meat to survive or to be healthy. And so eating animal products causes gratuitous suffering because it reliably um, involves kind of the torture, pain, suffering, and death of the animals who are consumed um, or whose products are consumed. And you talk to a meat eater and they're going to say, well, that's not gratuitous suffering. That's necessary for my gustatory pleasure. And my gustatory pleasure matters more than the uh, suffering and experiences of these animals. And so where there's disagreement is that this kind of what qualifies as gratuitous suffering, but there's still this overarching agreement that something like gratuitous suffering, unnecessary suffering is a bad thing, is reliably wrong. And so we actually do agree on what we might think of as like some basic moral principles across, across humanity, across cultures. There's just been kind of some basic ideas that um, we should have prohibitions on murder in societies, or there should be, um, we should be valuing truth telling. And these, these kinds of things are moral claims or ethical claims, but they also are claims that there's a lot of agreement about uh, across humans. And then there's, of course, disagreement about what counts as truth telling or what counts as as murder or something like that, um, or what exceptions to these rules might be justifiable, morally justifiable exceptions. And so there's a lot of room for interesting debate in these ethical kinds of um, questions, even as we agree on these more basic principles of things like gratuitous suffering is wrong, um, truth telling is good, just, you know, all else equal, et cetera. And so for me, I... I, I agree that there is like a lot of a disagreement across humanity, but I actually want to put pressure on the claim that that humans can't agree on anything. I think that I think that we are capable of agreeing on certain levels, right? Um, and the level of general moral principles, I think we can actually have some really interesting agreement. But be, beyond that, I actually I think that it's it's less ethically appropriate to assume without trying that agreement is impossible, that cohesion is impossible, that getting kind of a sufficient account of consent from humanity about something like messaging is impossible. And so I think ethically, we maybe have a responsibility to at least try, try to uh, get um, some uh, justifiable or, or uh, a useful degree of agreement or cohesion or consent from humanity. Um, and of course, how you do that and what that involves is, is going to involve a lot of philosophical, um, philosophically interesting questions and debate. But if you do something without even trying the alternative because you assume that some problem is a foregone conclusion without confirming that, um, then that might not be as appropriate as the alternative, which is at least trying, aiming, right? If we aim for consent, if we aim for consensus or cohesion as a species, as earthlings, um, we, number one, we might discover that that we can arrive at, at a useful account, right? I doubt we'll arrive at anything like 100%, but we might arrive with a workable account of agreement or cohesion. Um, but even if we don't, we tried, and that is ethically important, I think, that we attempted to get consent from humanity before doing something like this. And if it turns out we can't, and we think overall there's the most reason to message anyway, that's a more ethically appropriate way of going about it than just um, saying we're not even gonna bother. And so kind of how you arrive at your conclusions, how you arrive at what you're gonna do, it matters morally, it matters ethically, um, and it informs kind of what the appropriate future of of these projects involve. Okay. Um, Charles, I have a question about how, as a philosopher, you became interested in uh, SETI. How, what was your process to? Sure. So um, I became interested in SETI through uh, conversations with um, Julia De Marinas, whom you know, she's an astrobiologist, and I met Julia when I was doing my graduate work um, in Colorado, in Boulder, and she, I mean, she actually, for years, kind of 
you know, encouraged uh, or mentioned to me that she thought that this work, this astrobiological work, that there was a lot of really philosophically interesting stuff that didn't seem to be part of the debate, that didn't wasn't what people were talking about, but that she thought there was this opportunity for some really phil interesting philosophical or ethical kind of contributions. That there was room for that. And and to be perfectly honest, I um, I kind of just dismissed dismiss those things, um, you know, for, for years, in part because not a lot of philosophy is involved in like this question in particular. It's, it's not, it's not something you see in, in philosophy journals very much. Right. And so what happened, um, ultimately was we were, we were on a canoe trip and, um, this was maybe a year or two after, Medi International had sent um, a, a message to Lutun Star, I believe, and 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 there had been this sort of divide that was really, really starting to manifest, where some folks were really interested gung ho on messaging now, um, mm -hmm. and others were worried. Some some positively, so some folks are ready to actively message, ready to just start doing it under current circumstances without sort of <laughs> any more investigation into what humanity consents to or what regulations there should be or things like that. Um, and so ready to, ready to go, ready to message. And then others expressing like at least some hesitation or concern or calls to um, um, maybe have some intermediate steps before messaging or something like that. Um, or even to just be, be purely passive, right? There's that, there's that other side. And so we started talking about it and, and we just happened to be, um, be in a, in a setting where we got into a lengthy discussion about what was going on ethically uh, with this with this practice, and and we started. It kind of took off from there. And so she and I have been. She's been my kind of conduit for all of this important scientific knowledge that I don't really um, have access. I didn't have access to, or at least wasn't wasn't taking um, on the research myself. She provided me with all of this really useful information, giving me. The background, um, and then I um, noticed. I noted when the uh, when the anthology was published on um, the ethics of uh, space exploration, and I have a colleague who who kind of posted something about that, and I thought, oh well, that's really interesting. And I had just been talking about that, so I I got that book and started reading through it, and just the more I read through it, the more it was clear to me that there's just there's just such a rich area for not just ethical contributions, but philosophy in general to make contributions. And and there's definitely philosophers and ethicists making contributions, but um, there's so much to be done in this area that it really sparked an interest in me. And, and it took off from there. Um, and I've been able to, you know, attend workshops with um, the astronomers and the computer programmers and those folks at, at, at SETI at Berkeley and and the making contact workshops and to go to the IAC and to really start engaging with the scientists, with um, these other folks about their work, about these projects and, and to, to really gain an understanding of what's going on on the ground in terms of the science and then to bring in these Kind of more abstract ethical and philosophical ideas and questions and arguments and debates that are, I believe, really relevant to to these questions. Okay, I um, saw so that uh, besides doing your work as a scholar, you do also philosophy outreach. I don't know if that's a good term for it. Uh, you to, you teach uh, young uh, people uh, about philosophy. Do you think it's important nowadays that we um, think about uh, topics uh, through this framework of philosophy? I do. Um, and that's an unsurprising answer from a philosopher, of course, but um, I think it's I think it's a uh, very, very important, in fact. And so so here's why. So philosophy with with a lot of other disciplines, what they're doing is collecting this body of knowledge, right? Um, and they're updating it usually, and there are important things to maybe discard or include, but but there's 
basically answers, right? Um, most disciplines have a set of answers and they're constantly adding to um, or omitting whatever becomes kind of irrelevant or proven false to this body of knowledge. And philosophy is an outlier in that respect as a discipline of study. What we're, we're not trying to go out into the world and find empirical answers to questions. Um, so what philosophy does is advocate for an appropriate or a, or a good way of thinking about questions themselves, uh, reasoning, debating, arguing. And so what philosophy does is, is give us the tools to understand the fundamental assumptions that are going into whatever discipline we're studying, right? And to evaluate those fundamental assumptions, to understand how much uncertainty there is about things that we kind of don't really consider or don't understand are uncertain. Um, it gives us tools for reasoning consistently, logically, such that we can make progress, even if we don't find out what's ultimately true at the end of the day. And so, one thing that philosophy does is, so what we, what we do is ask philosophical questions. That's one thing that we do. And what makes something a philosophical question? Where here's an account of what makes something a philosophical question. It's usually not the kind of thing that we can determine the answer to through empirical reasoning, right? Um, or through empirical study. So we have to rely on, on our, our faculties of rationality in order to understand and answer philosophical questions. And so this has been the state of philosophy for millennia. And as we come to a greater kind of capabilities of empirical study and scientific study, we end up like outsourcing a lot of what used to be philosophical questions to other disciplines. So I was actually listening to earlier podcasts of this, of the show and early episodes. And uh, one of your guests mentioned um, the atomist. Uh, Democritus and Epicurus arguing that there's this kind of fundamental units that make up physical objects um, and they call them atoms and how ahead of their time they were, right? But at that time, 2,000 years ago plus, they weren't in a position to look into physical objects and understand what um, they were made of, right? What we had to do was speculate um, and investigate using our reason what, okay, so maybe this is, this is a potential explanation for what's going on with the physical objects. What are, what are the implications of that? What does that mean? Does it lead us to any inconsistencies um, or any issues? And, you know, there's, of course, all competing accounts and all of it's sort of up for debate until we can settle the answer um, until we can settle that question empirically. Of course, once we developed and we're able to kind of settle the question of, of whether they're atomic, you know, whether these atoms making up um, our everyday objects, then that's just not a philosophical question anymore, right? So what we're dealing with with philosophy are unsettled questions. And there are actually so, so many unsettled questions in the world. And what's needed is not more dogmatism, right? Not more people certain that their answer is the correct answer when it's actually, there's room for debate. And what we need is more open-mindedness and consistency in our thinking. And so what that's gonna do is allow for progress even if we don't arrive at 100% at certainty or, or knowledge or confirmation that we've arrived at the truth. Because at the end of the day, with so much of what we do, we don't have certainty. What we do have is reason is 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 careful reasoning, deliberation, open-mindedness, consideration of objections, challenges, such that we arrive at the thing that we have the best reason to believe is true. And the thing that we have the best reason to believe is true is not necessarily the thing that's true, right? And so what philosophy does is give us the tools to arrive at something that's really substantive and that can be well defended but that we should still be open-minded about and we should still be able to say oh that's actually an objection i hadn't considered that's a challenge that's worth thinking about so that we can be constantly updating what our justifications are for whatever it is we do believe so that we can get closer to the truth um, while still being open to the possibility that we're mistaken that we're wrong 
and being comfortable with something like uncertainty and doubt. And I think uncertainty and doubt make us really uncomfortable. And philosophy and studying philosophy, it gets people more comfortable with that prospect. And it gets people on board with the fact that there is so much more uncertainty than we usually let ourselves really be aware of. And, and that that's okay. And then that, what that means is that we should be open to dialogue, open to reason debate, um, open-minded in general. And, and that's something really useful that philosophy can give us across humanity, right? Well, I have to apologize that I lost the very tail end of that conversation with Chelsea and Danielle when we said our goodbyes and so on. But I think we got all the substance there. And so thank you, Chelsea Haramia and Daniela DePalis for joining me on this rather detailed discussion of the ethics of Medi. But really, we could have talked for hours longer. And hopefully we will as time goes on. So I'd like to invite you to go to wowsignalpodcast.com and we'll have show notes and links there, including links to past episodes like our conversations with Doug Vakoch and Julia De Marinas. And you can fully fill yourself in on the background. And we'll also have some links to things that... Dr. Haramia mentioned in her discussion. So, uh, please subscribe to the podcast. You can do that at any of your favorite aggregators, uh, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Pocket Casts or whatever it is you use to listen to podcasts. And stay tuned for lots more content coming up soon. And I would encourage you, if you're so inclined and you have a few extra bucks burning a hole in your pocket, go over to patreon.com slash wow signal and sign up to support us there. Now, obviously, we don't deserve as much support as other charities, but just a little. However, more important than your financial support of the podcast is sharing the podcast with your friends and on social media and also engaging with us. Now we are available in lots of places on Twitter at podcast. Wow. Uh, follow us there and we can have a conversation. We're on discord. We have a subreddit. We have lots of places where you can connect with us and continue the discussion that you heard on the podcast. So, By all means, please engage. Engagement is what keeps podcasters going. And sometimes lack of engagement is why podcasters take long breathers. So thank you for listening. This has been episode 48. The music has been by DJ Spooky, Erica Lloyd, and nest the wow signal is published under the creative commons attribution share alike license
So help me, Chelsea, your last name is Haramia? Haramia, actually. Haramia? Yeah, it's Croatian. I, I've been told uh, by various people from the area and surrounding areas that my last name means um, like horse thief on one side of the border and Robin Hood on the other. <laughs> <laughs>